The individual investor is so complacent right now, it's, it's unimaginable. If you talk to anybody, go to a party, do your own research, ask people if they're concerned about the stock market. They'll tell you no, what they're most concerned about, Don, they haven't changed any allocation in their 401k plan, they haven't moved to cash, for the most part, this is, you know, in general. They're worried about missing out on the next bull market because it's been inculcated to them for decade after decade that when the market goes down, the government comes to your rescue. That is not happening this time. It's going to be too little, too late. Hi, I'm Kaiser Johnson, and this is the Liberty and Finance and Miles Franklin Special of the Week for August 30th through September 5th. Currently, we have silver one-ounce Krugerrand, Britannia, Philharmonics, or backdated Canadian maples for only $4.75 over spot. Sovereign coins from some of the most respected mints in the world. The South African Mint and Rand Refinery, the Royal Mint in London, the Austrian Mint, and the Royal Canadian Mint. The Krugerrand of Britannia and Philharmonics are all 3 nines fine, or 99.9% .9 pure silver, while the Canadian maple is 4 nines fine, or 99.99% .99 pure silver. They are all approved for your precious metals IRA, and while there's no minimum order, the Philharmonics come in tubes of 20 coins, while the Britannia, Krugerrand, and Maple come in tubes of 25, and all of them come in monster boxes of 500 coins. We look forward to helping you secure your future and implement your precious metal strategy by locking an order of 2022 silver Krugerrand, Britannia, or Philharmonics, or backdated silver maples, all at only 475 over spot while supplies last. Call us today, tonight, or even after hours and weekends at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. It's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this returning guest who's widely sought after by our viewers. Michael Pento is the founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. He's an active money manager. And one of the things that our viewers comment about him, in fact, we have a comment right here from World Santum Darm Network saying, love this guy, Pento. He's not a perma bull nor a perma bear. He tells it like it is. And we just want to thank you, Michael, for joining us again on Liberty and Finance. Then again, love you, brother. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> We're uh, glad to have you. This is Tuesday, August 30th, 2022, and uh, there's been a lot going on in the markets. People have were riding up a sort of a relief rally, they thought, from the midst of this bear trend or rollover in the major stock markets, and now it's looking like that doesn't have legs. So could you first, before we get into specific viewers' questions, give us a broad view of what you're seeing the major context, the major setting that we find ourselves in, in terms of equity markets, debt markets, and the economy, financial policy, just you've given us lots of uh, updates along the way, month by month, as we go through these quarters. But could you tell us where you see us in that process right now? Well, I find myself in the uncomfortable position of actually, you know, listening, listening to what the Federal Reserve says, just listening. And I got to tell you, in life, people tend to hear what they need to or want to hear. So, um, I mean, it's very blatantly obvious that I was bearish at the start of 2022. I was absolutely correct. Thank God I was correct in that assumption. Um, I completely missed the July rally because in, in the July rally, what Wall Street needed to hear was a dovish pivot from Jerome Powell. I, I mean, they, they listened and they spun. And the reason why they do this, Dunnigan, is because most of Wall Street, most of the wirehouses on Wall Street have to be fully invested. So they, have, they really don't give much value add to their fees. If, if you're going to be fully invested just by SPY, maybe TLT, SHY, some bond and bond proxies, or maybe some overseas stocks, but you know, the SPY is the S&P 500, maybe the QQQ for the NASDAQ for some you know, little tech juice and just, just go home. And in 40 years, your, 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 your portfolio will be higher. I don't know if it'll be higher in real terms, but it'll be higher, most likely, unless you live in Japan. 
Uh, but um, if you want to add value, you have to go long and short the stock market. You have to be able to raise a lot of cash, which is what we did. And we, we allocated our portfolio towards the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse, which is cash, short-term treasuries, some long-term treasuries, shorts, short, actually shorting the stock market, and the U.S. dollar, long the U.S. dollar. And that's done very well for us this year. Completely missed the July rally because people needed to hear that there was some kind of pivot coming from Jerome Powell. Listen, Powell and any other central banker can pivot very easily to being dovish, stop hiking rates and ending QT. When the inflation rate is below their target level, that's an easy uh, pivot. It's an easy twist to make. But when your inflation rate was at a 40-year high, uh, several months before the, the speech from Jackson Hole, um, and when you measure inflation accurately at an all-time record high, and by a lot, not by a little bit, by a lot, by at least 500 basis points, so at least 20% inflation if you measured it accurately, um, you knew that there was no pivot coming. And you ignored trying to time a bear market bounce and just concentrated on getting the cycle right, the liquidity and the business cycle correct. So when there's lower lows in the stock market and lower highs in the stock market, I mean, if you want to believe in fantasies, then go ahead. But this bear market is going to continue until there's a genuine pivot from the Federal Reserve. And that's going to be put way out in, a, way out in arrears. It's going to be way too, too little too late precisely because of what I said. You cannot pivot when inflation, the sting and the embarrassment, don't even, the embarrassment of saying for a decade that we have to get to at least 2% and can't get there. And then it has to be above 2% for a certain amount of time because it was below 2%. And then, and then eclipsing 2% and going to almost double digits. Producer prices were in, into the double digits. These people have to regain some control of the narrative that they can pinpoint, dictate, and control inflation. They can't. Very, very difficult for them to do. But they want to have the, the ostensibly that credibility. So they're going to they're going to have a pivot. They will pivot. The put is there, but the put is way below the strike price, and it's way out in time. There's, uh, you've been talking to us about sort of a sequence of major events you, you see uh, happening, and it's always difficult to pin those down to a timeline. But as we move forward, you still see some of those same landmarks on the geography ahead. Uh, so Luke asks, expected timing for a credit market, quote, freeze up? I understand Michael originally scheduled this event on his calendar. <laughs> For Q3 2023, has his forecast changed or been deferred? Uh, I don't think I said Q3 23. I think I said Q3 22 is what I said. I'm pretty sure. I thought I could be wrong. Uh, uh, Q3 2022. Um, the Fed has started uh, pretty much in the next day or two. They will start to drain $95 billion a month out of their balance sheet. That is a destruction of $95 billion worth of base money supply. So in the instead of the Fed increasing its balance sheet or even just keeping it static, which is you know when you have a, a treasury, a mortgage-backed security mature, you go out, and go out to the Fed and say, okay, give me some more. I'm just going to roll over my, my, uh, my balance sheet. Now they're going to say, no, we're not doing that. Now when, the, now when a bond matures, they're going to sell the Fed, go and sell the bond to the public at a marketable price, you take that money, give it to us, and we'll destroy it. That's what happens when quantitative tightening occurs. Um, so we're going to have some liquidity constraints happening very quickly. And I think it happens in the fourth quarter. Now I'm saying, you know, in the third quarter now. Fourth quarter is right around the corner. Um, now, getting the timing, timing exact. Yeah, listen, here's what you have to know. Well, here's what I knew. The business cycle was turning. The liquidity cycle was turning. Being levered long. Uh, you know, meme stocks, the Kathy Wood Ark stocks was going to destroy your livelihood. So we didn't do that. 
But you're asking me about the timing. I would be surprised if it didn't happen by the first quarter of 2023. If we didn't have, if we didn't get some kind of complete freeze in the in the uh, money markets. But having said that, you don't need a complete shutdown of the credit markets to make money on the short side, especially now when you see, you know, we're like, I, I did the math this morning. We're 21 percent higher today in the S&P 500 than we were just before the pandemic. Uh, in what world <laughs> can people possibly claim that this market is fairly valued? We're trading at 17, 18 times uh, forward earnings. And the earnings, the denominator, is ridiculously uh, optimistic, in my opinion. So you're going to get the, the, the earnings are going to decline. The P-E ratio is going to decline. So the valuations are going way down in the stock market. And get that right and not worry about your, you know, your, you know, listen, I'm not a mission. Here's a, here's a news flash for you. Um, getting the cycle right is a lot easier than timing the date of the credit market freeze. I still think it's, it's still on the calendar. It's just probably out there a few more months then. As long as you've brought that up, why don't we talk about the business cycle? Can you tell us what you're, what you're seeing in the business activity that's leading you to believe? It's, a, it's absolutely a disaster out there. I don't, you know, if you look at what, what's the Fed looking at primarily is um, they're, the labor economists at the Fed are primarily focused on the non-farm payroll number. Well, I mean, that number... I mean, I know they don't make up numbers at, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but this number didn't jive with anything else you possibly could have seen, uh, any other data source. So, you know, the, the ISMs, the manufacturing, the service sector, their um, diffusion index, index was shrinking uh, before the last um, report. If you look at the household survey, that clearly shows that we're actually losing jobs. Um, there's a pretty significant increase in initial jobless claims. Um, the, there's a plethora of uncountable companies that have said, hey, we're not hiring and we're laying off. And some pretty big companies are out there saying that. So um, the labor market and the inflation numbers are lagging economic indicators and the unemployment rate is a lagging economic indicator. And I think, again, the Fed is going to get religion, but it's going to be a little bit too late to save the stock market which is still trading, as I mentioned, a, at a very lofty le level. As of this morning, we're trading at 166%, total market cap of equities, 166% 66% of GDP. Uh, that is light years above parity. So parity, for, so if you look at the market cap of equities as a percent of GDP, at 100%, that's where we were in 2007, at the end of 2007, before the stock market tumbled 30% going into the global financial, financial crisis. It's even higher than it was in March of 2000. So uh, this is not a market. This is not a valuation of equities, which is trading anywhere near where it should be, where you see the business cycle shutting down. The housing market is beginning to roll over. Uh, auto repossessions are, are ticking up very quickly. The labor market is starting to crumble. Um, and into that, we would normally see a Federal Reserve that was thinking about cutting interest rates. There's, this is the pivot. We're, this is what Wall Street's hoping for. This is what the fully invested dollar cost averaging, take your money, to, charge you a fee for doing nothing Wall Street is hoping for. They're hoping for the Fed to not hike by 75 basis points. They're going to go by 50 basis points, which is what I think they're going to do in September. The end of September. That's not a pivot, Dunnigan. <laughs> Hiking interest rates by really two and one, so they're not, not going by 25 basis point increments, they're going to go hopefully by 50. That's not a pivot. And draining $95 billion off their balance sheet is not a pivot. It's the most hawkish rate of change of a Federal Reserve that we've ever seen. Some people are looking out beyond whatever the big event is that's going to follow a freeze of the credit markets, uh, calling that a, a currency crisis. Uh, certainly, Alistair McLeod has talked about that and others. Pradeep Tumati, U.S., says, curious, what is the probability that the growth bubble would reinflate all over again after the currency crisis that is being predicted in Q3 of this year or beyond? 
Uh, well, you know, when you say the growth bubble reinflating, um, home prices were going up 20% per annum in the last couple of years. And, and still, even today, the last reading we had, I think it was the June number, year over year, 18% increase in home prices. Um, is, is that, first of all, you, you've priced out the first time home buyer. And you see, and this is, this is so upsetting, rents, in New York City at rental, this is, just came out from Bloomberg uh, data source, rent for a one bedroom in New York City is up some 40% year over year. And this is very sad, Don, again, there are people who cannot eat, who cannot feed their children and who are going to be homeless. This is, and, and this, this the, the, the fault of this isn't some uh, exogenous event or a pandemic or anything you want to blame on China or supply constraints. This is, this comes from borrowing $6 trillion and handing it to people and then telling them that if you go outside, you're going to die from a, a, a virus. And then you see, you see that too much money, $6 trillion over two years, chasing too few goods. Nobody's out there making anything because they're locked down in China and told not to go outside in parts of Europe and in, in the United States, all over the world, really. So you had this massive inflation. So when you say reflate the bubble, uh, it's going to take an awful lot to get the bubble to be reflated, especially how reticent even China is. Even Emperor Xi Jinping is saying, we can't go back to the credit bubble that we had before. I mean, the, 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 the average home price to income ratio in China, I, mean, I think it was like six or seven here at the height of the bubble about a month ago. I mean, there it's something like 14 times. It's, 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 it's incredible. They can't afford, and real estate is the economy in China. I think what I'm trying to say is that governments understand that um, inflation doesn't fix the problem. When inflation is the problem, <laughs> they're going to have to, ha they're going to have to allow for a period of time until, until the deflation and the depression gets so salient that it's uh, unbearable. They're going to have a period of time where they're going to try to return to normal and provide, and, and the illusion, the illusion of a soft landing, they're going to try to, they're going to try to, portray that illusion. There is no soft landing when total debt nominal in nominal terms and in terms of GDP is at an all-time record high. There's no soft landing. There's no soft landing when credit spreads are the tightest they've ever been in history. There's just no soft landing when the total market cap of equities to GDP was 210% in January of this year. There's no soft landing when there's $14 trillion worth of negative yielding debt around the world. Then again, bond prices were so expensive, price high, yield low, that you had trillions upon trillions of dollars that were negative, offered a negative yield. You made money by borrowing money. So when you, when you, and, and, and the real estate market too, let me just wrap up that triumvirate of bubbles, equities, bonds and real estate. When real estate prices are going up by 20% year over year and the home price to income ratio is at an all time record high, I don't care. I don't care as much that the underwriting standards are better. People can't afford their homes. And when Blackstone's buying huge tracts of lands and owns 20% Black, at Blackstone et al, or Wall Street investors, own 20 to 25% of all of the real estate market, <laughs> there's no shortage of housing. There's a, 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 an over exuberant abundance of specular, speculators in the housing market. And you can't get all three of these epic and unprecedented bubbles to pop and have a soft landing. <laughs> it's just not possible. You've talked now about some of the things that are actually going on in the real economy. Uh, there's modeling that you've done to try to look ahead because you talked about some of these things are that the Fed follows are uh, trailing indicators. And so they're always reacting too late, too late, too late. You try to look ahead and some of that requires modeling. There's a question about the, the viability of modeling in a 
over-controlled environment. William Mueller asks, Michael, we know you love your models. As we are approaching the, are we approaching the point where no models will work, considering that all markets appear to be increasingly manipulated and government so agenda-driven? Love my model. I mean, I create, I create the model, rigorously backtesting it to make sure that I don't read headlines from CNBS and get overly excited about this, that, or the other. Um, I don't want to look at 200-day moving averages like uh, the the the, uh, the halftime report. Say, oh, you know, we're going, we're coming up to the 200-day, and once we go through the 200-day, all of these uh, um, algorithms are going to kick in, and the people are going to just jump on top of the market and send it to the roof. And but no, no, listen, the model is predicated on the changes, the second derivative, so the rate of change of the rate of change of fiscal and monetary policies in the G3 nations. If you understand that, and then you marry that with the other components, the other 18 components of the model, which look at credit spreads, which looks at the treasury curve dynamics, and a whole bunch of other things that I don't have time to mention. And you say, you know, could I be wrong? Could I be wrong if I, you know, if I split aces in Atlantic City when the dealer has a six? I, I could be wrong, but I'm playing the odds. And I'm, I'm telling you that there's 81 Central banks around the world that are tightening monetary policy because of record high inflation. And there's um, a huge fiscal constraint. The, imp- the fiscal impulses have gone into reverse for the most part. Um, you know, we, have, we argue about, well, Joe Biden passed this, you know, half a trillion dollar or whatever uh, uh, forgiveness of student loans. Um, and then this Inflation Reduction Act, you know, um, but on the margin, first of all, I can argue that people have to start paying their student loans in January. <laughs> so if you're not paying, you haven't paid your student, you haven't paid your student loan in three years. You, you have a fifty thousand dollars student loan. It's now thirty or forty thousand dollars. You haven't paid it for two years, and now you're going to have to stop start paying it in January. I'm not sure if that's really a fiscal stimulus. I don't think so. Um, but uh, raising taxes on corporations is in the fiscal stimulus. You know, the minimum corporation tax has been raised to 15% uh, based on what the government accounting office says your earnings are. So um, there's, a bu- there's a bunch of offsetting things, but there's nothing, second derivative, there's nothing that matches the $6 trillion that was passed between 2020 and 2020, and this beginning of 2020. Nothing that compares to that. So 2022, this is the beginning of the calamities. We just started uh, reducing the balance sheet. Uh, it's been very slow to start, but because of settlements, and I, I did do some very boring and tedious research on this. Uh, I got a lot of information also from Quill Intelli- Intelligence from Danielle DiMartino Booth, uh, who is excellent. Um, there's some settlement disagreements when it comes to the balance sheet where the Fed will buy something, say in May. Uh, they'll actually buy a mortgage-backed security, but won't settle it on their balance sheet until June or July or August. And so it looks like the balance sheet isn't shrinking, but the actual purchases are, are, are long gone. Now, all those settlements wash out at the end of August, and then you're going to see $95 billion every month. We've never That's twice the pace of monetary destruction than it was at the height of QT, in 2019, and just remind you what happened with the repo market in 2019. Um, and here we have a Fed that's in 2000, in, in the summer, late summer of 2018, had to stop hiking interest rates. Remember, they were good. They were two and a half, Dunnigan, and they said we're going to three and a quarter or higher. It's very similar to what we have today. Um, and, and at that point, we're only doing $10 billion a month of quantitative tightening. Um, and then the Russell lost 30% of its value in a matter of weeks between like Halloween and the end of the year. And the S&P lost 20. Um, well, I think something similar is happening right now. We have more debt now. We have a, a Fed that's just as hawkish, if not more. And we have, you know, basically, you know, five times the QT that they had in 2018. Well, you remember, again, Remember, there was a pivot in December. In December, Powell said, I am no longer going to hike interest rates. And in September of 2019 said, QT is now over. In fact, he hinted many months before that, that QT was going to end early. Let's see. Right now, it's not a good time to be massively long the stock market without any hedges. That's all I'm saying. Have some hedges in place like I do for me and my clients. 
Um, the time to pivot is down the road. One more thing I want to say about that. When Powell stopped hiking rates in 2018, and when he stopped doing QT in the summer of 2019, do you know what the inflation rate was back then, Dunnigan? 1.7. Bravo to you, sir. It wasn't anywhere near 8.5%. So speaking of uh, the, the Fed taking action to uh, tighten or to affect the interest rate and it, how it affects the bonds as well, Acme Corporation asked, do you think the Fed implemented yield curve control? Rapid U.S. 10-year yield drop in the middle of June suggests it. Of course they <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't need to laugh, but of course every time they do QE, what do you think QE is? QE is the purchase of mortgage-backed securities to lower interest rates. And these are duration assets. QE is duration assets. They're buying some bills, but mostly long duration treasuries to put a lid on, like Japan. <laughs> Japan, the insolvent nations doing the same thing. They're, it's, of course, it's yield, yield curve control. Of course. They're capping long-term interest rates. That's, that's what QE is all about. Buying assets from banks, keeping the yield low, compressing yields, treasury yields, to an all-time low, and then bringing every other yield around it down. And that includes municipal bonds, includes corporate debt, junk bonds, everything else you can, you know, CLOs, every, every other collateralized bond comes down in yield. It is dragged lower by that lower yield. So, of course, it's yield control. Absolutely. In the face of the uh rolling over of the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market. Questions keep coming up about, is this the time for commodities? Uh, Paul Burkerholt says, do you think investing in commodities is a good idea now? And if so, what vehicles exist for the retail investor to invest in commodities? When do you want to invest in commodities? You want to invest in commodities when inflation, the rate of change of inflation is accelerating on a global basis. That's especially true for silver. Um, if you're buying commodities now, um, with the possible exception of energy, possible exception of energy, and, that, and I say, and I'm going to emphasize, possible exception of energy. If you're buying anything else, um, and maybe, maybe a uranium, maybe. If you're buying agricultural commodities or if you're buying base metals, I mean, you're just, you just comp in my opinion, you've been off sides and you're going to be even more off sides. Going forward, you just don't you just don't buy commodities in an environment of disinflation, deflation, and recession globally. It's just it's just a bad idea. So I and I myself, um, you know, I think the oil look the price of oil recently was up by twenty percent, and I think I'm looking at X, XLE, the energy sector. And energy, you you'd, you'd be up twenty percent this year if you bought it in in January, but if you bought it in June or July, <laughs> you're down twenty percent. So you've got to be very careful when you're entering into a condition of um, peak inflation and peak growth globally. And I firmly believe that is the case. Commodities are a very dangerous place to be. And I just call your attention to. Uh, July and August of 2008. Just look at look at the chart of energy, particularly oil, during that time frame. And I know things are different now, the supply constraints, yeah, yeah. but the, de the 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 decrease in demand for these commodities is going to be so salient in the next few months and quarters that it's just very dangerous. You don't have to do that. You don't have to expose yourself to that because when the oil market churns, Chain turns and it and it turns in a brutal way. You can be wiped out very quickly. Just just put again, do yourself a favor. Put up a chart of XLE and the uh, and and oil in the summer of 2008, and tell me if you want to be there, because I think we're heading into something very similar to that. So it sounds like in the in the face of what you see as a as a playing out of a major recession slash depression that's going to be deflationary. Uh, where do people want to be? Well, you know the four horses of the economic apocalypse. I talk about them all the time. If, if you, if, if in January, uh, you just said I'm going to raise a lot of cash, 
I'm going to be heavily invested in the U.S., going long the U.S. dollar, not because the U.S. dollar is a great currency, <laughs> but because against the euro, it's going to look spectacular. Um, and if you shorted the market uh, and you own treasuries, which was a mistake, three out of the four horsemen are working. One of them is not working. I think that other horseman is going to work. Um, so if you only if you own those four, you'd be about unchanged on the year. Maybe you know down or down a little bit as on your waiting to those allocations. Um, but I think going forward, and if I'm wrong, I'll change because I am still I'm still long treasuries right now. I'm long treasuries right now because I think the economic data is going to be really really bad very very soon, even worse than what we've seen already. Um, and when that happens, I think Treasury is going to catch a bid despite Q, QT happening. Because if you look back in the last QT, when the QT started, it was very bearish for Treasury. So price down, yield up. But once the economy started to erode significantly, uh, Treasury caught a bid. So I, I'm, that's what I'm in, investing for. And if that happens, then all four horsemen will be pulling together. And you probably, of course, can't make any guarantees, but you probably will make money in this, what I call this grand reconciliation of asset prices. Um, and you'll be, and even more importantly, or at least as importantly, you'll be, at, you'll be wonderfully positioned for what I see on the other side of this, which is a protracted period of stagflation. Because I do assent to the idea that the Fed will indeed pivot. They will stop QT. They will cut interest rates regrettably, and with, with, with much reticence, they will do so. But when you, when you go back into some kind of reliquifying of the money markets, um, so soon after 9% inflation, you're just pretty much telling everybody, hey, the do US dollar is garbage. Um, there is no protection against inflation. We are not going to ever defend the purchasing power of our bonds, of our, of our interest payments on our sovereign debt. Um, it's a very negative sign you're giving to, to the world. The, the, the global investors of uh, our, the reserve holders of our currency and our bonds. So be very careful of, be very careful of the timing. The timing is, of course, difficult. That's why people are with me, because I have pretty good history with the timing. But just this, you know, this set it and forget it portfolio of, hey, you know, the Fed's going to pivot and who cares if you lose 50 percent of your portfolio? First of all, they, met, they never admit that there's going to be a bear market. And even when you're in a bear market, they never admit it. They tell you it's going to turn around and imminently. And then they get you all excited, like in July, that, you know, the, the market's going to go to the moon and we're going to new, new bull market has started. And, you know, you get these people who say they're going to have a, a crack up boom or a melt up. It's all it's all malarkey. It's all people trying to sell you things, gold, or they're trying to sell you newsletter. They're trying to sell you on their buy and hold strategy. It, listen, like you said, starting this program, my number one goal is always just to, here, here's a pile of money. Where is it best going to be treated? And there are times I'm going to go you know, massively long the gold market. I was on your program about a year ago, and I did pretty well with it. Uh, but now I'm only 5% gold. I don't know if that was one of your questions coming up, but gold is going to be an, an absolute. I think gold is going to be one of the biggest winners coming out of this next flip from Powell. But in, in an environment where you have disinflation, right, which boosts up real interest, which boosts up real interest rates and nominal rates are rising still. They're, they're kind of plateauing, but they're still, you know, they're not falling yet. They will soon. So that's that's a that's an increase in real interest rates, which is what gold hates the most. OK, but there's going to be a time where the Fed's going to have to capitulate out of duress under duress. They'll capitulate, capitulate, start printing an enormous amount of money, push down on nominal yields while they're generating inflation, which is what a fall in real interest rates. When you get that message from Powell. I don't think you're going to be able to buy, you know, you're not going to be able to own enough gold fast enough. So it's, it, it's all about timing. And that's what God willing, I'll be continue to have some kind of value add to provide my clients. 
this I think this question adds a little bit more color to what you were just describing, and maybe you could uh, uh, respond in a way that helps people to see it from that that perspective. The crypto bunker asks if you've been watching Ray Dalio recently. He continues to say cash is trash. No one should hold a bond. With bonds continuing to perform terribly, interest rates rising, meaning people are selling bonds. Dollars being printed left and right by our government. Can metals become a safe haven for big money, regardless of rising interest rate environment? Because holding bonds and dollars, you're holding a debt instrument. Okay, so there's some truth there, and there's some fiction there. So that the the government is not printing money left and right. Um, and as I admit before, bonds have not worked yet. They just you know, listen. When you're wrong, you're wrong. I started owning them in March and April after I thought was the the major uh, implosion in bond prices. Um, but there there haven't there hasn't worked. Hasn't worked yet, so it's start, but it's starting to give me a lot of inclinations that is is starting to work. TLT has, which one of the uh, ETFs that I own is, is is clearly bottomed in my opinion. Um, but the, the printing, you know, again, disinflation, deflation, recession, depression are are the times when you can make a pile of money in bonds, going long bonds. That's the that's the history. Now, maybe this time is different. I don't know. Maybe it's different because QT is going to be at a record and uh, maybe China is shedding you know, their reserves. I, I, there's a lot of reasons why it could be different this time. And if it is different this time and I monitor the situation and I deem that it's no longer working, then I will sell. But uh, for right now, I'm going on what my, my rigorously backtested history tells me is that when you have disinflation, deflation, depression, recessions, you have to own bonds. It's a major leg of your portfolio that's uh, it's essential and i think when people give finally start selling stocks here here's one for you i think apple i think apple's like 10 percent or some seven to ten percent of the entire s p 500 so in, instead of buying bonds as your safety net they're going into apple as their defensive apple and google they have a little bit of a dividend there and hey if the economy does great then these stocks will do wonderfully. Um, when people start panicking, the, the individual investor has zero panic in them. I know institutions have a, about 6% cash. So they've raised some cash. They're not 2%, they're 6%. They're not overly, overly over their skis in cash, but they have a lot of cash. The individual investor is so complacent right now, it's, it's unimaginable. If you talk to anybody, go to a party, do your own research, ask people if they're concerned about the stock market. They'll tell you, no, what they're most concerned about, Dunnigan, they haven't changed any allocation in their 401k plan, haven't moved to cash for the most part. This is, you know, in general, they're worried about missing out on the next bull market because it's been inculcated to them for decade after decade that when the market goes down, the government comes to your rescue. That is not happening this time. It's going to be too little, too late. Michael, I never had a chance to ask you this. Well, I guess I had plenty of chances. I just never did it. We've asked Rick Rule this. We've asked Alistair McLeod this. But I've never asked you. Uh, one of our viewers suggested this question. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Um, I, it, it depends. It depends what brand. But it, chocolate chip mint has got to be you know, way up there for me. But sometimes it tastes like toothpaste. You have to get a good, you got to get a really good brand. You know, down here in Florida, Publix has a premium ice cream, which their their chocolate chip mint is phenomenal. What's the Publix. brand? It's a regular. Oh, yeah. oh, it's the actual yeah, the actual yeah, yeah. grocery store. Okay. Um, uh, Publix Premium is uh and it's not an endorsement in any way. <laughs> like any remuneration from this. I just just uh, I recently asked my wife. I like to ask her about her childhood. She and I both simultaneously said that as children, by far and away, our favorite flavor of ice cream was mint chocolate chip. So, so great exactly minds what you're saying. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just a good answer. So, uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, uh, Rick Rule's answer is old-fashioned peppermint, and Alistair's is clotted cream. See? Just straight, you, you unflavored tell, clotted you, cream, which sounds like the most British answer you, you could come up with. You can tell I was born so, in Queens, there you right? Go. Yeah, you asked me a question. Chocolate chip mint, like clotted, clotted strawberries. You know, I mean, I just, like, you know, well, I'm a regular guy. You know, I just a, a normal guy. Yeah, um, and uh, 
I, I like chocolate chip mint and I'm here. Uh, I'm like a, a street smart guy too. You know, I'm here fighting and working hard. I'm working. I, I might not out jump you. I'm only five, seven. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do a lot of things to a lot of people, but I will outwork most people I'm here every day, working my butt off to make sure my clients are successful. So where do people go online if they want to connect with street fighter, Michael Pinto? <laughs> Oh my gosh! Well, no, no. This is uh, if people want to find you because you've talked about your services as an active money manager for people who want someone who's in there fighting for them on a daily basis, and not just the the uh, set it forget it uh, uh, so called financial planner who who just sets their their autopilot goes out and, and spends the rest of his day doing other things, but not really watching the store for yeah. his clients. Well, you know, most people are most people in this business, unfortunately, are salespeople. They're, they're, they're trying to generate leads. You know, I I do nothing to generate leads, I, except come on shows like yours. And then people listen to that and then hopefully they, you know, they sign up. If you have $100,000 to invest and you're a U.S. citizen, you can contact me at pentoport.com, me and my small staff here. And I will, I will personally manage your money according to the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle. And that's the difference between me and a lot of people. I don't have 15 different models. I don't have a... I don't have a team of a hundred money managers that I've hired that go off on their own and buy what they want. No, this is, we, we put you in, you have an, you'll have an individual account at Charles Schwab. It's your, your account in your name and I will block trade positions and then give you your percentage. And I do the same thing on the sell. So it's very scalable, ex extremely efficient. And I only have a couple of hundred million or more under management. So it's not a multi-billion dollar conglomerate here. But if you want to have personal care in, in someone who only, whose only motivation as an SEC registered fiduciary is to make you money, protect and profit in all economic conditions, then come to the website, pentaport.com. You can email me at mpento at pentaport.com. You can call the office at 732-772-9500. There's a new Naples office and number in there, which I don't even know because I didn't memorize it yet. But you can reach me on the contact page on the, my website. And I'd be happy to, to discuss your portfolio with you and how we can get you protected now. It's not too late. It, you know, it's, it's not early. <laughs> it's not too late. But most importantly, I think these cycles, these boom bust cycles are going to become more intense um, and short, short, the intervals between them will be shorter in duration. So the frequency will be, you know, will increase and the intensity will increase over time. We're heading into choppier seas. Buckle up, get ready. All right. We've been speaking with Michael Pento, active money manager at pentoport.com. Michael, as always, on behalf of all of our viewers, thanks for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Always my pleasure, Doug. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. 
That's 1-888-815-4237.